Well, the first thing is to say thank you very much to everybody uh, for being here, but especially to uh, CES and to the University of Munich for uh, giving me this honor. It's a wonderful uh, honor, and I'm really pleased to be here with you. And uh, it was also great to have my friend uh, Fabrizio Zilibotti to give such a nice speech. Uh, it was also sort of a relief when I heard him speak in English because I was getting worried whether the whole sort of event was supposed to be in German. So if he had broken into German, that was going to be a bit of an embarrassment for me. Uh, and uh, that was a very touching speech. And uh, thank you, Fabrizio. Uh, uh, I certainly did not know the list of papers that uh, got more than 1,000 sites. Uh, then that list, there were three papers that were joined with Fabrizio. That's why he was uh, emphasizing <laughs> some co-authors there. Uh, I also did not know, and I still don't believe that uh, I get 10,000 sites a year. I think that's uh, a made-up number, but we can challenge that later on. And I'll also challenge the uh, theory that uh, it's just the alphabet, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, Fabrizio, uh, though, ignored to tell you an important detail, which is that, uh, you know, my first academic relationship with Fabrizio was that I hired him as an RA. He's forgotten that. <laughs> so it was such a memorous, uh, momentous occasion for him. You know, I was one year ahead of him at the LSC, and uh, I had already started working as a research assistant, and we had... Uh, uh, we had a project with uh, my friend Andrew Scott at the time, and, uh, and we had a little bit of money, and then Andrew came up with the idea of hiring a research assistant, I guess because I was doing the theory and Andrew was doing the empirical work, and he wanted to offshore part of that. Uh, and uh, so, so we thought Fabrizio was a very promising candidate. Well, uh, unfortunately, that paper never got written. <laughs> But, uh, but, but, but I, think, I think Fabrizio was a much better co-author later on than <laughs> research assistant. So, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really uh, a very, very nice uh, speech that uh, uh, you gave Fabrizio and, uh, and all of the comments. Uh, you know, the saying is uh, that uh, I wish my uh, parents were here you know, my father would have been proud and my mother might have even believed it, so... Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, uh, and uh, now I have the difficult task of A, living up to expectations, which I want, B, talking about something a little bit more sort of technical after all these wonderful speeches. And uh, so let's see how I sort of handled that. I'll try to talk loud so that nobody falls asleep. But uh, uh, so I'm going to talk about political economy of state building. Uh, this is based on joint research with James Robinson. And I have, sp uh, I have chosen this topic for a number of reasons. Because first of all, it's sort of something that's going to enable me to talk a little bit about some of my previous research, but it's substantively new work. In fact, it's a little bit too new, perhaps, because I have, uh, I have never given it in front of uh, such an audience. Uh, I have given little bits and pieces of it in more academic settings, so uh, excuse me if I sort of mess it up or something. Uh, and then I think also third, that uh, the issues here, though quite sort of different from what economists normally think about are, are, are quite central, and I'll try to sort of make that case. So, uh, this map, or some version of it, will be very familiar to uh, many people. This is a heat map of uh, prosperity, GDP per capita and purchasing power parity, and it shows what many people already know. We live in a world of great, great, great disparities. So the dark green areas, such as Switzerland, Germany, United States, are about 
50 times as rich as some of the poorest nations that are in sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, and, uh, and the Caribbean. And uh, this is the, was the starting point of a lot of the research that I did uh, in the 1990s, 2000s, and led to the book uh, Why Nations Fail that uh, uh, has been mentioned in the previous speeches. And, and it's also motivated you know, countless other economists and social scientists. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about this dimension of prosperity directly, but what I'm going to talk about other things that are often associated, but not in a sort of a mechanical way with that. So the dimensions of quality of life, when you think about it, are not just about how much money you have in your pocket, but a whole lot of other things that people care about. They care about health, they care about safety, they care about governments that are responsive to them, that are protective of them, that are not arbitrary, that are not uh, incompetent. And if you look at each one of these dimensions, and I could count many more, you see an almost equally striking difference between the high and low parts of the world. So this is, for example, infant mortality. Uh, the differences are absolutely mind-boggling. So instead of the 50-fold, actually, you have something like 100-fold difference between the high and low infant mortality places. So in the, uh, some, of the, in some parts of the world, you know, children die at 100 times the rate that they do approximately in some of the healthiest parts. And this is just national averages. If you go subnational, and I'll talk a little bit about subnational later on, the differences are even bigger. Actually, there's one thing else that's, uh, that's something else that's even more striking, and that's security of life. If you look at murder rates, actually the differences are even more than 100-fold. So in some places such as uh, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Central, uh, <coughs> Central America, for example, uh, and South Africa is coming close to it, Haiti, uh, the murder rates are more than 100-fold of what you, for example, experience in places like Munich or, uh, uh, or other uh, major European capitals or cities. So these are just truly striking differences that matter, of course, as much as, uh, as, much as prosperity differences. Now, if you look at this map, you'll realize that this is actually quite different from this map. The places that have low infant mortality are not exactly the same ones that have low uh, or high murder rates, or even for this map. If you go down, now a little bit more sort of uh, subjective, but people have also collected data and coded things like that also matter for us. For example, is uh, the government uh, able to act in an impartial way, or is it captured by some interest groups or responsive to bribes or some other uh, powerful individuals? There's a huge amount of variation in that. It seems quite different, but still big gaps. You know, Western Europe scores well in many of these dimensions, but for example, the US doesn't score so well in security of life. Perhaps that's not surprising for anybody who reads the newspaper. Uh, but, uh, and, and this one is professionalism, which is whether the recruitment into government services is meritocratic, whether you know, the government works uh, more or less like uh, Max Weber uh, sort of envisaged it as a meritocratic bureaucracy, uh, responsive to its tasks, etc. Again, a huge amount of variation. So I want to think about what explains these differences a little bit more systematically. And one starting point is just to think that these are just implications of the prosperity differences that uh, I already mentioned and many people have talked about, including James and I and Fabrizio and I and so on. So for that, let me start developing a little bit of the argument of the book that James and I wrote, which very much draws on the prior academic articles. But the reason why I'm doing that is because uh, 
I'm, not, I'm going to go in a slightly different way, complementary to the arguments of why nations fail. I'm going to draw on them or some of the mechanics of that argument. Uh, but, but, but I think uh, in order to appreciate that, knowing a little bit of the lingo and the ideas of that book would actually be useful. So what did I and James argue in that book? Well, uh, it's already been mentioned, uh, but I want to just give you a little bit more of the detail about the argument. So we argued that these institutions, uh, which were sort of emphasized, uh, uh, are important. And what do we mean by institutions? So we started with economic institutions, those that regulate our economic lives, and we distinguished two polar cases. Again, of course, the world is interesting and it's in the gray area, not in the black and white polar cases, but the polar cases are useful for thinking about what's going on. And the two polar cases are extractive economic institutions, uh, which is sort of the bad end, which we associated with you know, lack of law and order uh, so that you know, people cannot protect their property, so insecure property rights. Uh, markets that are not functioning because they're sort of uh, monopolized or created artificial monopolies with entry barriers and uh, lack of public services that are essential for creating a level playing field so that everybody in a society is able to uh, compete in economic activities or partake in economic activities in a gainful manner and especially for that le uh, lack of level playing field, lack of a judicial system that's able to abjugate disputes in a fair manner. So that goes back to that impartiality and professionalism indices that I was showing. At the other extreme, inclusive economic institutions, uh, we talked about essentially the opposite, secure property rights, markets that are functioning because they are not uh, created, they're not behind artificial barriers, uh, courts that are upholding contracts and adjudicating disputes, and underlying it, supported by state services such as investments in infrastructure, health, and education, uh, a level playing field that's going to enable everybody to take part in investment, productive gain, work, and innovation. But as soon as you start thinking about these two extremes, and many of the countries you can put into those uh, sort of bins, the, the question is obvious, you know, why is it that these societies end up with these different economic institutions and persist with them? Perhaps they might stumble on some really bad economic system, but why do they persist decade after decade and century after century? And the reason is political, and that's where the politics of the economics and politics twin engines come in. And uh, if you sort of want to think about it a little bit, you know, again, this is simplifying the argument, simplifying the reality, but take a quintessential example of an extractive economic institution that would be chattel slavery. So take a society like Barbados in the <coughs> uh, uh, 17th century, for example. At the end of 17th century, Barbados was actually uh, one of the richer parts of the world because it was so productively producing and exporting sugar, a very uh, valuable commodity at the time. But it was a society in which more than 80% were slaves, working under very harsh conditions, and uh, essentially at subsistence or below subsistence. As a result of these very, very harsh conditions, they died most of the time before they reached the age of 30 from overwork, from underfeeding, uh, from harsh conditions, or sometimes just being killed. And there was a huge amount of inequality. In fact, the inequality in that society went beyond the 80-20 mix because much of the gain from the slavery system was enjoyed by a group of plantation owners, the ones that really monopolized the biggest land, and they were the ones that, enjoy, uh, that employed uh, most of the slaves, and they were the ones that produced and exported most of the sugar. So how that system survived? Well, if you want to think about it, you have to think about the politics. The politics is very interesting. The same group of planters that really benefited from the slavery system entirely controlled the political system. If you look at the top judges that decided what the law was and implemented it, they came from these, uh, uh, you know, dozens of families that were the major plantation owners. The army was crucial. Why? 
because the slaves were not happy at all, so they con continuously tried to run away or actually rebel. You know, the, if you look at the history of uh, Haiti, Dominican Republic, that Hispaniola Island, uh, or, or, or Jamaica, or, 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 or <coughs> Cuba, or, or Barbados, they are stories of, they are histories of continuous rebellions. So the army had to put them down. Who controlled the army? Well, it was the top generals were uh, from the same families. And what about the legislature that, you know, was, uh, was, was actually the governors or the top uh, executive of the island, again, from the same families? So that's a system that is striking in the extent to which it monopolizes political power. And that sort of monopolization of political power, together with lack of checks on the exercise of that power is a very specific political system. It's a political system which we called extractive political institutions to emphasize that it's a political system that easily leads and gets fed, supported by extractive economic institutions. And likewise, at the other extreme, inclusive economic institutions are supported by inclusive political institutions, which are those that have a more spread out, even distribution of political power, and introduce natural checks coming both from institutions, such as separation of power, judicial review, etc., as well as from civil society and so on, on the exercise of that power. So the, uh, the story, therefore, is in a simplified way, is summarized in this sort of two by two. So these, oops, this inclusive economic and inclusive political institutions support each other, and inclusive extractive economic and extractive political institutions support each other, and those arrows are meant to convey the idea that you can have societies with inclusive economic institutions living under extractive political institutions, but they don't tend to be stable because one side starts pulling. But we also emphasize in the book uh, a sort of a secondary but still important idea that actually for inclusive economic institutions it's not enough to have a broad distribution of political power, but you also, which we call pluralism, but you also need some degree of political centralization. Because unless you have political centralization, power goes up to the top to some degree, and that top is able to enforce the laws, enforce law and order, educate disputes, regulate economic activity as necessary, you're not going to have a well-functioning economic system. Somalia, the example we gave in the book, is still a case in point because it's a society of still extreme uh, e political equality at some level. There are no very well-established elites uh, that dominate politics and so on in, in Somalia, despite, you know, uh, decades of dictatorship, military dictatorship, socialist military dictatorship uh, uh, that, that they survived in the post-war era. But it's a tribal society organized around tribal lineage lines, and the tribes themselves uh, resolve disputes, uh, but they don't do very well when the disputes are between different uh, clan families. And when that happens, there are feuds, there is chaos, and so on and so forth. And in a society like that, without the ability to educate disputes that are relevant for the marketplace, that are relevant for the social life, of course, economic progress doesn't take place. Uh, public good provision, health, security certainly don't care to take place. So this political centralization sort of ideas were already uh, out there in the economic literature in our work, but I'm going to come back to them. The other point that I want to emphasize, and this is going to be relevant again for, for what I'm going to talk about, is that, you know, extractive economic institutions supported by extractive political institutions are not an aberration. They're not some stupidity. They're not, uh, you know, you get these sort of uh, accounts sometimes that, you know, African dictators are so uh, kleptocratic because they are short-sighted. They don't understand that they can actually enrich their society. It's not that simple. Just like the Barbados example, you know, even something that's unjust, 
and economically inefficient in the sense that Barbados, that, had, that was so rich, became gradually poorer and poorer as soon as its comparative advantage that was so major in sugar sort of started being eroded. Uh, it, it did nothing else. It did not diversify. It did not invest in anything else and ended up with a low-income, low-middle-income country. Uh, so that economic inefficiency does not easily get corrected because extractive economic institutions supported by extractive political institutions have an economic logic. And the, the reason for that is that not every dictator would like to make their country as rich as possible. They would like to make their, their country as rich as possible as long as that's consistent with their economic and political and social objectives. Economic objectives, the country may get richer, but they may not themselves get richer. In other words, if you reform a extractive economy, you may be the economic loser because the gains might happen in other sectors to other newer technologies or newer individuals. And that's exactly what was the problem of Barbados, that even after sugar ceased to be a good place for its labor to be deployed, the economically and politically powerful groups did not want the economy to diversify away from sugar because that's not where their uh, economic interests lay. But actually, an even more important thing is that you might fear to be a political loser out of reform. Because if your political power, which is ultimately the arbiter of the distribution of resources in many societies, stems from a particular social configuration, from a particular economic and political uh, arrangement, then reforming that is a very dangerous business because the moment you reform that, you're unleashing a lot of forces that gradually weaken you and all of your sort of resources, uh, economic and political resources, start being drained. So that fear of political creative destruction and the fear of economic creative destruction both contribute to a uh, stickiness in economic and political institutions even when they are very blatantly inefficient in, from the viewpoint of the country's GDP as a whole. Okay, now we come to the topic of today's lecture with that background. State capacity. What about state capacity? What about the state? So it sort of played a little bit of a role in that political centralization. But if you look at around you today, almost every major global crisis has something to do with the inability of states to cope with certain problems. The problem in Greece is one of state capacity as much as the corrupt politicians having captured the state. The state just lacks capacity in Greece to be able to do many of the things that you, know, you might take for granted in Greece, I mean in Germany. But even more saliently, the migrant crisis and the threat from ISIL that are so alive in the minds of everybody here today, I'm sure, are very much related to a total lack of state capacity in the Middle East and North Africa, where societies have developed in such a way that still does not provide any way for these states to be able to contain uh, political forces, disputes, conflicts, and any sort of small disequilibrium that results from a variety of things, from the Arab Spring, from the death of their dictators, and so on and so forth, totally uh, opens the way to a civil war, to huge refugee humanitarian crisis, and so on. So why this state capacity? What is that, and how does that sort of feature in it? Well, actually, state capacity is obviously the sort of the, the, the thing that might also come to your mind in the case of the huge infant mortality and uh, murder rates that I showed you at the beginning. You know, it's not simply that Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, all three of them have democratic elections. Uh, actually, <clears throat> you know, they've had some problems, corruption problems, etc. But but right now they're no longer dictatorships or, or tin pot uh, regimes. They all would like to be able to control these huge murder rates, so does the Mexican government, uh, but, but they're just unable to do so. Same thing with huge infant mortality rates. 
you know, sometimes this goes on for negligence, neglect, but in many times it's just this lack of state capacity. And there is mounting evidence, some of it I'm going to talk about tomorrow, <coughs> that <coughs> state capacity does matter for many other aspects of economic outcomes. So what is this state capacity? And in what ways can we think about it? So by state capacity, I mean simply the capacity of the state to do the functions that I have already outlined. Impose law and order, control violence. So those relate to military aspects of state capacity, what, for example, again, Max Weber emphasized as the monopoly of legitimate violence. It relates to the state being able to regulate and control economic activity. For example, what's missing very much in Greece. In Greece, one of the things that is a problem is the state not being able to collect taxes. In fact, that turns out to be a huge problem around the world. So if you've uh, read a lot of uh, simple macroeconomics, uh, you would get the uh, feeling that taxes are a major negative determinant of economic activity and there is some negative effect from taxes, no denying that. But if you look at the cross-country data, this is the picture that emerges. Actually, the rich countries tax a lot, the poor countries generally don't tax very much. And that's very much this lack of state capacity. Many of these countries don't tax, not because they don't want to. You know, Mobutu, Mugabe, uh, Bashar al-Assad, they would all love to tax and line their pockets even more, but they just can't. The state doesn't have the capacity to be able to do that. And third, the capacity of the state to educate disputes and deal with legal problems. Again, huge differences. You know, Pakistan looks like a normal state from the outside, perhaps, but half of the territory it has left it to tribal groups to deal. They have their own laws. It does not try to uh, do conflict resolution or impose any laws in those, uh, in those areas. And the capacity of the state to provide public goods, such as education, uh, healthcare, infrastructure. Again, huge differences. <coughs> so where do these differences come from? The capacity of the state is so basic that you might think it should be just a axiomatic thing that every state, the first time they are able to do it, they should try to build this capacity. Wouldn't every dictator want to have as much military control, as much ability to regulate economic activity so that they can use the resources for whatever purpose they have, including lining their pockets, including making their country grow glorious and famous and whatever? Well, it doesn't work that way. It seems that a lot of countries either don't invest in state capacity or don't succeed when they invest. This is one of the things I'm going to argue. The second sort of obvious idea that might come to your mind, and you would be in the company of great, uh, illustrious social thinkers, is that the way to build state capacity is <clears throat> first have a very strong authoritarian government that authoritarian government defeats all the competing groups, establishes order, and then out of that state capacity flourishes, out of that perhaps other good things including economic growth could flourish. This idea is also very much in fashion. It goes back, I'm sure, centuries, but the modern version is uh, uh, articulated by a political scientist called Samuel Huntington and it has been essentially probably the most influential sort of thesis in uh, international relations. For example, almost all US interventions are motivated by some sort of the Huntingtonian thesis, the state first thesis, meaning that the first thing you do, you build a legitimate state, uh, you find somebody who looks like a state in the international arena, acts like a state inside, and then once that state exists, whether it's Stalin, whether it's Karzai, whether it's, uh, you know, whoever it is, then you can go to the next stage. Well, that theory uh, may or may not be scientifically valid, but its track record in practice is pretty poor. Uh, you know, that was uh, the modus operandi of, for example, the U uh, Western interventions in Afghanistan and Somalia, uh, in both cases very badly backfiring. What I'm going to argue is that both of these perspectives are not right. 
the reality is more nuanced is, and is actually closer to the opposite of this in a way that I'm going to try to uh, articulate. So building state capacity is neither an engineering problem that every <coughs> dictator, every state leader can or uh, would like to or can do, nor is it something you can easily impose from the, uh, from the top down so that then, then you can go to the next stage of development like uh, Samuel Huntington and his followers and uh, many people in the US State Department believe. So what I'm going to argue is this picture. So this is a theoretical picture, and, uh, <clears throat> but, but I'm going to try to sort of flesh out uh, several parts of this in the next 25 minutes or so. So what I have here, and it's a great simplification, what I have here on the horizontal axis is some sort of pluralism-like thing, this equal distribution of political power in society, non-domination of one single group or one single individual, and so on. And on the vertical axis, I have the strength of the state, where both I mean the ability of some state to be able to do stuff, including military control, and also perhaps institutionalized things. So what I'm going to argue is that you can roughly think of the world as falling into three regions. Region one, which I'm going to call states stunted from the bottom, are those states where to start with, we start somewhere like this, where there is quite a little bit of pluralistic control at the bottom, social norms and either proto-institutions that empower society against powerful individuals and proto-state institutions. All of these will hopefully become clearer when, as I go through examples, but I'm sort of giving the roadmap for the examples. When that happens, state building's just not going to get off the ground. So you stay, start, start here and you stay in this region. In this region, which I'm going to call Region 3, it's, uh, you're going to have the state start strong, so you have an authoritarian leader. But in fact, as opposed to the Huntingtonian thesis, in many cases, you're not going to have the Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan of this capable guy. What I'm going to have, what James and I call paper leviathans. They look like a leviathan. To an untrained eye, they might look, they can take their seat in the UN and so on and so on, but they're made of paper in a way that sort of the analogy is clear. And it's only in this region where to start with, the strength of the state and pluralism are balanced. Strength of society versus strength of the state is balanced. And in this region, these two evolve together. They co-evolve one feeding of the other. So let me give you some examples to sort of uh, make the a little bit clearer. So this is a map of Nigeria, and this is Tivland. Okay? This is one of these all stateless societies that survived well into the 20th century, so it gave an uh, opportunity to anthropologists to see. You know, anthropologists and archaeologists study all these ancient civilizations, either through those that remain or through archaeological records. But the Tiv are a relatively well-preserved relatively well-preserved society in southern Nigeria, and many anthropologists, especially uh, uh, husband and wife team, Bonanons, uh, went there and lived there for a long time, so we have a fairly good understanding, and there were other Nigerian social scientists who also wrote about them. And uh, so <clears throat> the Tiv had this issue of cults, cults and witchcraft, as in many other societies were very important. So, for example, in 1939, as the Westerners were still observing it, there were these huge upheavals in there. And these upheavals were centered around this cult, a uh, religious cult that looks very sort of weird at first. They, this religious cult had, uh, had these uh, very strange things. They had their brushes and, uh, and sticks that they would wave against people, against witchcraft. But actually, when you look into it, there was a lot of method to what they were doing. The, the theory of many of these cults were that, you know, there is something called sav, which means in the Tiv language, power. So power was a very bad thing in the, uh, in the, in the Tiv language. In fact, sav, or it's plural, but sav, means both powerful people and witches. So 
the sort of same thing, power, and these sort of nefarious things that eat f human flesh, uh, that you make, you, you, make you, you make yourself more powerful by eating uh, sort of these, uh, these other people's heart and things like that, were all sort of associated. In 1939, what happened is that these cults all turned against the British chiefs that were appointed. Before the British appointed chiefs, the Tiv did not have chief, uh, chiefs. They were a very decentralized thing. Much of Nigeria had this thing. The British, in their indirect rule, tried to rule these places by appointing chiefs. But these chiefs never gained legitimacy in most parts of Nigeria, but especially in the south, because all of the social norms and the arrangements of the Tiv were very much directed against them. And why were they directed? Well, if you study, and this is what essentially the Bonanons did, what you realize is that the modus operandi of these societies, this dense network of social norms and arrangements, were all centered on preventing anybody lest, you know, uh, and especially these appointed chiefs from accumulating too much power. And that power could be economic power or political power. So the Tiv have taken strong measures to overcome the, the Mbatsav, these powerful people or the witches. These big movements have taken place over a period of extended from the days of the ancestor into modern times. This was the sort of the account of a Nigerian. Uh, and, uh, and Bonanon essentially summarized this. This was all a logical defense of society. They would do this so that their greater political institutions, those of lineage systems and egalitarianism, that does not allow these powerful people to emerge, could survive. So you see this very strange logic of a fairly strong social norm and fairly strong distribution of political power at the bottom preventing these more powerful people from emerging. And of course, once you do that, you can never build a state because a state means somebody needs to give an order, and those orders need to be obeyed, all the competing uh, claims have to be defeated, and so on and so forth. Now, this is not a sort of uh, an ancient thing. You have many similar examples of this today, ranging from you know, the tribal areas of Pakistan that I mentioned uh, in, in, in other parts of South Asia, but most tellingly in, in Lebanon. You know, uh, Lebanon, and I, I'm running out of time, so I'm not gonna go into the details, but Lebanon sort of consists of a patchwork of 18 communities, and the whole balance of Lebanon is such that none of these communities and a state does not become powerful enough. The constitution is written in such a way that there is continuous power sharing, but it's more than that. The parliament is essentially inactive. It doesn't do much. Most of the time it doesn't meet. It meets once or twice a year. Uh, Lebanon has sort of essentially functioned without a parliament for you know, about 10 years. It says, uh, never, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, there has never been a meeting of parliament to deal with the refugee crisis, which is much more serious in Lebanon than in Germany, for example. And all of this is because there is a continuous fear of one group dominating. One particularly extreme example is that Lebanon has not even conducted a census since 1932 because there's a fear that if they conduct a census and they found out that population shares have changed, that's going to require readjustment of power and nobody wants that. And of course, Lebanon does not have a modern army and does not have a police force. Most of that work is done by groups like this. This is Hezbollah. So this stunting from the bottom is fairly clear. But what's the logic? And is this logic just a perverted one? Well, not really. And the logic is not a totally perverted one because what these societies are really afraid of is that once that state building, which is a prerequisite for these good aspects of state capacity gets off the ground, then you're going to have these states act in a totally uncontrolled way. Because there is no guarantee that once these powerful people emerge in the TIF, there is no guarantee that they can control them in the future, so they want to nip it on the butt. But once you start thinking about it this way, perhaps it becomes that this is just going to be the kiss of death. It's never going to be possible for a society to have 
state building without crushing that entire fabric of social norm and society's nascent pluralism. Perhaps Huntington is right after all, so those cases would not be a contradiction to the sort of Huntingtonian logic. But in fact, in this part I'm going to go very quickly, if you look at what I called Region 3, where the state starts strongly, in fact, you have two things that go on in most of these examples. First, the TIV's fears are proven right. In many of these cases, when state building goes forward rapidly, it does so by totally crushing those uh, existing social norms, existing local elites, existing uh, arrangements that were, uh, they, they had their own ways of conflict resolution and so on and so forth. And in general, it takes a pretty extractive form. Whoever controls the state starts extracting more and more resources, sidelining all of, the, uh, all of these uh, uh, different voices. But secondly, and this is the paper Leviathan part, in many cases, it doesn't even go forward that far. Military predominance of some state-like actor is sometimes established, but even that is not sometimes established. So here I give an ex other example from my work with James Robinson, which is Colombia. Colombia has a state that looks very modern. If you go to Bogota, uh, it's, a, it's just like any other sort of capital. It has a well-functioning uh, legal system in Bogota. It takes its space in U the UN. It actually has an army that's very strong. Uh, but despite all of these things, if you look at the country, not only the guerrillas have been fighting a civil war since the 90, early 1960s, but actually about one-third of the country is under the control of these paramilitary group, right-wing paramilitaries, that were originally formed to fight the guerrillas and protect la uh, the mafia, the, 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 the sort of the drug lords and some of the landlords, but then sort of branched out into drug running, ex extortions, setting up checkpoints, and all of these things go on under the watchful eye of the army. So you have checkpoints that the paramilitaries set up, next to it there's an army barrack. The paramilitaries kill people and uh, displace them from their land, uh, two, two, three miles away you have the army barracks. And this is one of the leaders of the paramilitaries of the early 2000s, you know, he says, we, we said 35% of Congress was elected in areas where we controlled, we made sure that we were the law there, we collected taxes, we provided public goods, and uh, people voted the way that we said they would vote. So again, this is an example of a state that looks very modern, but it is unwilling to even extend its m monopoly of uh, uh, control of violence to its own territory. And all of this has a logic similar to what I talked about, the political losers. A lot of this happens because the same logic that made uh, authoritarian, dictatorial, extractive leaders that set on uh, other aspects of extractive political institutions unwilling to reform these institutions because they were afraid that the moment they, unwill they, they, uh, they do that, there is going to be reactions and counter-reactions that will erode the basis of their political power. You have the same fear of state capacity building. So, so far this looks very gloom. In Region 1, Nothing happens because civil society is too strong. In Region 3, now st the state tramples everything, but it doesn't look like the Huntingtonian uh, or modernization type of good thing where good things come out of that. So where did, like, the Western places come from? Like, where did the English state emerge from? Where did the Athenian state emerge from? So the, uh, if you look at Huntington's book, he says, uh, you know, all of, or Tilly or other people, their view of the English case is one of this sort of state building. But in fact, let me go quickly and mention first Greece and England, and then I will conclude with a few last thoughts to sort of pulling everything together. So Greece is actually very interesting because, uh, as many people know, uh, around... 700 BC, the Greeks started building very modern looking institutions, democracies, and so, so on and so forth. Much of the evidence that we get from the uh, Greek historians are from different ages. You know, Homer sometimes talks about the uh, Greek Dark Ages, sometimes about the Bronze Age big empires. But, but actually, the key events sort of took place uh, later on. 
One is Solon started a series of reforms in 594 BC, which are amazingly pluralistic. Economically, they made ensurfing and slaving of Athenian citizens illegal. They established freedom of movement, freedom of uh, uh, trade within Attica, the broader area, implemented land reform. Politically, they set up an assembly, which is very democratic. This assembly actually had a lot of, a lot of power. People uh, served in the assembly. Uh, every, it says what it's called, let me summarize it, some people call this collective re responsibility by amateurs. Essentially everybody, all the uh, adult males participated in it. Elections to the most important parts of the assembly was by lot. Almost every Athenian citizen served at some point in this assembly, and the assembly was very strong. And the Cleisthenes, uh, uh, which came about 80, uh, 90 years after Solon, sort of uh, strengthened this, uh, these, these things and actually made some aspects of it that were not fully implemented, implementable. One of the most interesting things that Cleisthenes introduced, which was not in Solon, is this law of ostracism. Solon had this hubris law, which banned uh, any individual becoming too hubristic, in particular humiliating others. Does that sound a little familiar? Like if you become too powerful, the tiv, well, actually, Cleisthenes' ostracism law is even more familiar. What it did is that just like the Tiv had these cults of, against powerful people, Cleisthenes introduced this ostracism law. Ostracism, the word ostracism actually comes from this. It introduced a, a, a system where if the assembly first said that there would be an ostracism, then all Athenian citizens would write on shards, pieces of broken glass called ostracon, the name of an individual, and that individual, whoever he is, would then be forced to leave Athens for 10 years. Actually, and here is an example of this. This is the name written here is Themistocles. Uh, who is Themistocles? Themistocles is probably the biggest military hero that Athens has ever had. He was the person who designed the uh, Athenian navy and also was an amazingly successful uh, war leader against the Persians. But the people, the Athenians then decided he was getting too big for his bridges, he was getting too powerful, they shipped him out in the same way that the Tiv did. But the difference is that in the Athenian case, these social norms somehow started off with a state that was already had the capacity, so it could actually build these assemblies that were more sort of wide ranging than this small sort of uh, kin level uh, unity that, that the Tiv had. So what you ended up is, going back, I can go forward, I have the same picture, but let me just, so instead of ending up here, you ended up here. So what you had exactly in the Athenian case is that over time, the democratic institutions got strengthened, and as the democratic institutions got strengthened, state capacity increased. By the end of this golden age of Athens, Peneplesian board brought it to an end. You know, Athenian state could provide infrastructure, could provide education, could do a lot more sophisticated things that the Europeans, uh, you know, would ever be able to achieve for another, uh, you know, perhaps 800 years, perhaps more. So finally, the English case. Well, isn't the English case one of, you know, top-down state building, the Tudors, Henry VII, Henry VIII? Well, yes and no. Exactly like what I emphasized, you need the state to have some strength, which is what the Henry VII and the Henry VIII started doing, which is they disarmed the barons. That was very important. When the barons were armed, it was just like Somalia. There were clans fighting each other, War of the Roses, uh, which brought the Tudors to power, being the sort of the latest ramification of that. But at the same time, you had these huge process of bottom-up political mobilization. So this is sort of an interesting case. Uh, this is a, a surviving document for the, uh, at the end of the 16th century from a call, place called Swallowfield. And it's, it's amazing. This is the people from, from Swallowfield, the middling sort people, that brought 
got together. They formed their own assembly. They, they set up their own laws and started making demands for these laws to be enforced by the top. You know, if you read this, uh, every, every man in the swallow field will be heard in a democratic fashion. All the things will be recorded. So this is what this says. Uh, paper record so that we know what we are doing. This is a resolution concerning willful and vile sins, and they are demanding more and more services from the government. So the state is getting stronger, but at the same time as the state is getting stronger, there is a thick network of society that's also able to defend itself against the state, and that in turn let the state get even stronger. So in other words, the sort of the story I'm telling is one where pluralism enables some degree of state building. And again, the English case illustrates this, contrary to the very top-down view, very clearly. So uh, the Glorious Revolution, which you know, we emphasized, a lot of other people emphasized in previous work, as a turning point in terms of the strengthening of these participatory pluralistic institutions in the English case, you know, it was fought against James II and absolutism, and James II's uh, uh, efforts to try to control fiscal policy, uh, monetary policy, borrowing, and you, know, you would expect that once the parliament took power from James II, what they would do is they would reduce the size of taxes that they were so complaining about. You see the, exactly the opposite. What happens is very well documented in John Brewer's book, for example, taxes treble almost in the next 30 years. So what's going on that once parliament feels that the state is under its control, it wants the state to do more because then the state could be responsive to its own demands without the fear that with the TIV head, once the state forms, it's going to crash us. But it's more than that. It's not just that pluralism leads to state building. State building leads to pluralism. And the reason for that is, A, once the state is able to educate these disputes, then that enables the civil society to develop more. But even more importantly, perhaps, once you know that you want to strengthen the state, if you want to prevent the resistance from society, one thing you want to do is to give more and more voice to society. And that's exactly what Henry, the, Henry VIII did, actually. Henry VIII, at the same time as he was disarming the barons, he also sort of strengthen parliament. This is sort of the king in parliament, the Cromwellian strategy of state building was give them voice, take their arms away, but give them voice so that they know that I'm not going to be out of control. All right. So let me conclude. So at the end, what I have argued is that the state capacity is of utmost importance both to understand the world we live in, the political problems, and also economic development, but we haven't done a great job of understanding it. Instead of the sort of the top-down view or the engineering view of state capacity, I have tried to propose a somewhat new view, I think a generally new view, which is that state capacity gets best developed when state capacity and the strength of the state co-evolves and gets strengthened as at the same time as the social norms and the decentralized or sometimes even centralized institutions that are able to check against that power of the state. But that also is not a guarantee because many societies will be here or here, military societies societies will be here. If you have a military leader impose this, you will be here for a long time, unless you're shook, shook here or economic changes shift these boundaries around. But if you are in this lucky middle, that's where you can get off. But it also means that when we think of intervening around the world or policy around the world, it suggests a very different perspective than perhaps that that results from ignoring state capacity, taking state capacity as something that we can just invest in and create, or assuming that state capacity is something that US military, together with the help of somebody like Karzai in Afghanistan, can easily build. Okay, I'll just stop there. Thank you.